Before we move to Prime Minister's questions, I would like to inform the House that it has been just over 60 years since the first ever PMQs, which took place on the 18th of July 1961. On that day, the Speaker at the time was Sir Harry Hilton Foster, who was the last Speaker to die in post, so I hope not to reintroduce that. It was introduced PMQs by informing the House that the Prime Minister, Harold Macmillan, was willing to try this experiment for the remainder of the session. It that be the wish of the House that after 60 years, 12 Prime Ministers, PMQs, has become one of the most high-profile events of the parliamentary week, and is watched by constituents across the country, followers of UK politics around the world. I think we can say that the experiment has been a success, depending on who was on the answer. But I've got to say, today we mark its 60th anniversary. The Prime Minister will join the questions via video link, for obvious reasons, demonstrating that Prime Minister's questions in the House can adapt when we need to. I am sure that this final PMQ, before the summer recess, we will have a robust but orderly exchanges and hopefully shortish questions and answers. And finally, before we get underway, I would like to point out that the British Sign Language Interpretation of Prime Minister's Questions is available to watch on Parliament Live TV. And please, everyone have a good recess after tomorrow. We now come to Sally Ann Hart. One, please, Mr Speaker. Yeah. Mr Speaker, thank you very much, and I'm delighted to be joining the House in the 60th anniversary edition of Prime Minister's Question Time, which, as you have rightly just pointed out, was, of course, uh, an innovation introduced under Harold Macmillan, and look forward to answering Connie's questions today. Mr Speaker, before the House rises for summer recess tomorrow, I know that everyone will want to join me in thanking parliamentary and constituency staff and the dedicated House of Commons staff uh, for hard work over the last year, and I hope very much that everyone has a restful break. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings, virtual meetings, I should say, with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my virtual duties in this House, I shall have further such virtual meetings later today. Sally Ann Hart. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I echo the Prime Minister's thanks to all our staff for their hard work this last yeah. year. I very much welcome the Government's levelling up agenda to ensure opportunity and economic freedoms are enjoyed by every person across yeah. our yeah, four yeah, nations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hastings and Rye is being held back, prevented from achieving its potential, largely or partly due to a lack of transport infrastructure. Will my right honourable friend promise to consider the business case for the HS1 extension from Ashford through to Hastings, Bexhill and Eastbourne and commit to the funding necessary? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, my honourable friend is a fantastic advocate for the people of Hastings and, and Rye and she's made the case to me before for the improvement to, to transport that she as she recommends. I know that uh, the particular extension is being reviewed by the Department of Transport right now. A decision will be made in, in due course, and I'm, I'm told I simply cannot uh, anticipate that. But what I can say is that this is the government and uh, the party that is absolutely determined to level up across our country with better infrastructure, superb innovation, Mr Speaker, and better skills across the whole of the UK. We now come to the Leader of the Opposition, Keir Starr. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I also thank you and all of the House of Commons staff for everything you've done to keep Parliament open and safe? Can I wish the Prime Minister that the Chequers won well in his isolation? With half a million people self-isolating, I think we're all a bit surprised that the Prime Minister, the Chancellor and the Cabinet Office Minister were all randomly chosen for a get-out-of-isolation free card. Uh, but it's good that the Prime Minister finally recused himself, even if it took a public outcry, for the Community Secretary to be humiliated on live TV and a trip to a country estate. Yep. Mr Speaker, if someone is pinged by the NHS app, as millions will be over coming weeks, should they isolate? Yes or no? Mm -hmm. Mr Speaker, is the answer to, to that. And uh, I think that uh, everybody understands the... Uh, the inconvenience of being uh, being pinged, as as he rightly says, here I am. I wish I was 
uh, with you in the in the uh, in the Commons chamber today. I apologise to everybody uh, in business up and down the land in all kinds of uh, services, uh, public sector or otherwise, uh, who are experiencing inconvenience. We will be switching, as the House knows, to a uh, a system based on uh, contact testing rather than uh, contact isolation. But until then, Mr. Speaker, I'm just must remind everybody that uh, isolation is a vital tool of our defense against the, the disease. Uh, you're five times more likely to catch it if you've been in contact with someone that gets it, uh, and someone that, that has it. And of course, even if uh, you have been vaccinated, you can still pass it on, though that risk is, uh, is reduced. And uh, the overwhelming arguments, Mr. Speaker, are for getting a jab. Everybody uh, should get a jab. Keir Starmer. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister says that everyone understands the government's position as to what you should do if you're pinged by the NHS app. That's a very interesting answer, because the government's all over the place on this. Yes, yesterday, his business minister said the app was an advisory tool only. Another government minister, and I kid you not, said yesterday the app is just to allow you to make informed decisions. What on earth does that mean? Inf allow you to make informed decisions. And of course, the Prime Minister and the Chancellor spent the weekend trying to dodge isolation altogether. So, Mr Speaker, the British people are trying to follow the rules. How can they when his ministers keep making them up as they go along? No, Mr Speaker. If I may laboriously uh, repeat the answer that I gave uh, earlier on to the Right, honourable gentlemen. So, so just to, to get it into his uh, his head yet again, uh, isolation is a very important part of our armoury uh, against COVID. We're going forward, as, as everybody knows, to a new system on August the 16th, based on based on testing. But in the meantime, when you're advised to, to isolate to protect others and uh, to protect your family against the spread of the of the disease, then you should uh, you should do so. And uh, of course, even uh, more important than uh, the isolation campaign is, of course, the the vaccination campaign. Three million people uh, of the 18 to 30 group uh, still to get one. I think uh, the right honourable gentleman's time will be more usefully employed, if I may say so, encouraging uh, everybody to get vaccinated. Here's Starmer. Well, Mr Speaker, everything may be calm from the Prime Minister's country retreat, but back here, the truth is we're... We're heading, we're, heading for a, we're heading for a summer of chaos. There's a lot of noise, Mr Speaker. I, I hope they've all got their NHS app on. Um, Mr Speaker, we're heading for a summer of chaos. One million children were out of school last week. One million. And a huge number of businesses are closing because so many staff are self-isolating. So let me turn to the question of exemptions. Yesterday, the messages coming out of number 10 about which businesses and workers might be exempt from isolation changed hour by hour. First, yesterday, there was going to be a list, and then there wasn't. And then the Prime Minister's spokesperson said this, and I quote, we are not seeking to draw lines specifically around who is or who is not exempt. Now, I've read that, and I've reread it, several times, Mr Speaker. I haven't a clue what that means. <laughs> the Road Haulage Association hit the nail on the head when they said this, and I quote, that it was fought up on the hoof without proper organisation or thought. Now, Mr Speaker, I know, I know the Prime Minister likes to govern by three-word slogans. I think, Mr Speaker, I think on the hoof might work pretty well. So, Last chance before recess. For millions of workers, this matters. Or, or, order. Mr Gullis, I don't need any help or assistance from yourself. The next time you point to your watch, might be better looking at Big Ben outside rather than here. Come on, Mr Starmer. So, Mr Speaker, last chance before recess. Can the Prime Minister just clear it up? Which workers and which businesses will be exempt from isolating before the 16th of August? Mr Speaker, I think this is really pretty... Uh, feeble stuff from the right honourable gentleman in this what's going to be a glorious 60th anniversary edition of, uh, of PMQs. I, I've given him uh, the answer in a, in a letter that he had uh, earlier on uh, about the, the businesses and the uh, sectors of industry that we think that it would be sensible now to exempt. But he can't have it 
both ways, Mr. Speed. He, can he attacks the self-isolation system. But as far as I understand the position of the Right Honourable Gentleman when it comes to uh, the, uh, the roadmap, he actually now this week opposes uh, going forward uh, with step four, uh, as, as we have on, as we did on Monday. He wants to keep this country, as far as I understand his position, in lockdown. And now, now which is it? He can't have it both ways. He can't simultaneously, Mr. Speaker, uh, attack Sorry, the- Prime Minister. So, pl and, shh, and, and wait, call, Prime uh, Minister, just a moment. We're really struggling on the sound level. I don't know whether we can actually have the sound level turned up to hear the Prime Minister. I'm sorry. OK. Prime, if you... Thank you, Prime Minister. Otherwise, you've got a great standing who's quite desperate. But I want to hear this, Prime Minister. I, um, do you want me to have another go, Mr Speaker? Hang on a minute. Is it this thing here? Sir, I want... ...to quite well. People would decided to be quite rowdy, but I can hear you now. Continue halfway through. Can you hear me, Mr Speaker? Mr. Speaker, can you hear me? Can hear you loud and clear, Prime Minister. Do you, do you want me to give that answer again? Oh, don't worry. Just complete the end I'm bit. Very happy. I will repeat it. I'll, I'll say it as many times as you like. I think the, I think the right honourable gentleman, the leader of the opposition, uh, is, is guilty of, of, of failing to listen to what I said just now. And it's perfectly obvious that, uh, as I said to him in a, in a letter earlier on, uh, earlier on, that there are some uh, businesses, some parts of uh, our economy that, of course, uh, need uh, exemptions from the uh, test, the isolation regime, because they need to uh, they need to be able to carry on. And uh, for the most part, obviously, people will have to follow uh, the rules. We're changing it on August the 16th, by which time we will have vaccinated many more people. Uh, I understand people's frustrations, but this is one of the uh, the few few real uh, tools that we have to uh, in our armory against the, the virus. And I, I really think that in an attacking the isolation system, which is what I think the right honourable gentleman is, is doing, uh, he is being totally inconsistent with his earlier announcement, which seemed to be that we should we should stay in lockdown. If I understand the position of the Labour Party now, uh, which is different from last week, they now don't want to go ahead with step four. I, I think I'm right in that. Kirsta. It talks about inconsistency. Two hours and 38 minutes to do a massive U-turn on Sunday morning. And then what have we seen in the last few days? Um, he says I didn't listen to his answer. I did listen. I still think he's making it up. We had completely unclear announcement on Monday about exemptions and contradictory statements all day yesterday. Now we seem to be back to the confused policy of Monday. How on earth the business is meant to plan when the Prime Minister keeps chopping and changing like this? I have to say, even after 15 months of these exchanges, I can't believe that the Prime Minister doesn't see the irony of him spending Freedom Day locked in isolation and, and, and announcing plans for a vaccine ID card. I remember when he used to say he'd eat an ID card if he ever had to produce one, and now he's introducing them. So, Mr Speaker, when it comes to creating confusion, the Prime Minister is a super spreader. So let me try to get, let me, let me try to get some clarity. Why is it OK, why is it okay to, go for a, to go to a nightclub for the next six weeks without proof of a vaccine or a test, and then from September it will only be OK to get into a nightclub if you've got a vaccine ID card? Minister. Mr Speaker, I think the, the Labour leader traditionally has a choice in a national crisis, and that is whether to uh, get behind the government and uh, to, be, or to offer constructive opposition or to try endlessly to oppose for the sake of, for the sake of it and to try to score cheap uh, political points. Everybody can see that we have to wait until uh, at the end of September, by which time it's only fair to the younger generation when they will all have been offered uh, two jabs before we consider something like asking people to be double jab before they go into a, a nightclub. That's blindingly obvious uh, to everybody. It's common sense. And uh, I think most people in this country understand it. Most people in this country want to see the younger generation encouraged uh, to get vaccinations. That is what, uh, if, with great respect to the right honourable gentleman, uh, he should be doing rather than trying endlessly uh, to score what, what I think are vacuous political points. Keir Starmer. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister keeps asking me if I will support his chaos. No! And I want to bring the Prime Minister back 
to one of our earlier exchanges in this House. On the 26th of May, I asked the Prime Minister if he had ever used the words, Covid is only killing 80-year-olds, or words to that effect. On that day, the Prime Minister pointedly did not deny using those words, and now we have the proof that he did. We have all now seen the Prime Minister's text message. I quote, the median age for Covid fatalities is 82. That is above life expectancy. And we have the Prime Minister's conclusion in the same text. So get Covid and live longer. Remind the Prime Minister, over 83,000 people aged 80 or over lost their lives to this virus. Everyone leaving behind a grieving family and loved ones. So will the Prime Minister now apologise for using those words? Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, nothing I can say uh, from uh, this dispatch box or uh, from this virtual dispatch box, I, I should say, or uh, nothing I can do can uh, make up for the loss and the, the suffering that people have endured throughout this pandemic. And uh, there will, of course, be a public inquiry into, into what has happened. But I would just remind the right honourable gentleman, when he goes back over the, the, the decision-making processes that we had in that in those very, very difficult and dark uh, times, that these are incredibly tough balancing uh, decisions that you have to take. Again, you have to balance the catastrophe of the disease against the suffering that is caused by, uh, by lockdowns, the, the, the impacts on mental health, the loss of life chances for young people, Mr Speaker. And the, the, what has changed uh, since, the, uh, since I, 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 we were thinking in, in those ways is, of course, that we have rolled out uh, vaccines faster than any other country in Europe. 96%, uh, Mr Speaker, of people over 50 now have had a vaccine. 68% of people have had two jabs, Mr Speaker. What we're trying to say to the, the country today, and I think the single most important serious message is, if you uh, have not yet had your second jab, please come along and get it. And if you're over 50 and you still haven't had uh, your second jab or over 40, please come and go, get it as well. And never forget, Mr Speaker, that if we'd followed the advice of the right honourable gentleman, we would have stayed in the European Medicines Agency and we would never have had the vaccine roll out at all. Dama. Speaker, I think we might need to check that the line to check us is working because the Prime Minister's answers have no resemblance to the questions I'm actually asking him. He's given us a list of what he can't do. What he can do, quite straightforwardly, virtually or otherwise, is say sorry. The trouble is, Mr Speaker, nobody believes a word the Prime Minister says anymore. He promised he had a plan for social care, but he's ducked it for two years. He promised not to raise tax. Now he's planning a jobs tax. He promised he wouldn't cut the army or the aid budget. He's cut both. And, Mr Speaker, he also promised that Monday would be Freedom Day. He said 18 times from that dispatch box that it would be irreversible. But the truth is, he's let a new variant into the country, he's let cases soar, and he's left us, he's left us with the highest death toll in Europe, one of the worst hit economies of any major economy. Last week, a million kids were off school, businesses are closing, and millions will spend their summer self isolating. But don't worry, Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister's got it all under control. Because this morning we read he's got a new three word slogan Keep life moving. You couldn't make it up. Mr. Speaker, isn't it clear there's only three words, three words this Prime Minister needs to focus on? Get a grip. Prime Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, let's look at the position now uh, as it was at the uh, end of last year. And as we come to the end of this, parliamentary term, uh, let's be absolutely clear that it is thanks to the vaccine rollout, uh, which, by the way, as I, I never tire of repeating, would have been impossible if we'd followed his advice, uh, that nine million people have now come off furlough. Unemployment is two million uh, lower than predicted. Job vacancies, Mr Speaker, are 10 per cent higher uh, than they were before the pandemic began. Business insolvencies uh, are lower than the, before, before the pandemic began. He wants three word slogans, uh, Mr. Speaker. I'll, I'll give him a, a, a three word slogan. Uh, we are, well, our three word slogan is get a jab and, uh, and get a jab. And by the way, uh, what we're also doing is help people to get a job. We're turning jabs, jabs, jabs into jobs, jobs, jobs. That's the agenda of this government uh, by taking sensible, cautious decisions, uh, rolling out 
the vaccines in the way that we have, we are enabled, uh, we have been able to get uh, this country moving and to, and to keep it moving. Uh, and I've listened to him very carefully this morning. I have absolutely no idea what he proposes to do uh, instead, except keep us all in some sort of perpetual lockdown and limbo. He has no answer to the question of if not now, when he has no plan, he has no ideas, and he has no hope. Mr. Speaker, and whilst we in this government are getting on with getting our country through the pandemic and delivering on the people's priorities. Greg Williams. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The levelling up fund is a very welcome investment in Montgomeryshire. It's a game changer for our county council and critical investment at this very critical time. Specifically, we would like to reopen the Montgomery Canal. It's our levelling up bin. It sadly was disconnected from the UK networks and dis decades ago and has been kept alive by a terrific team of volunteers. Will the Prime Minister use the weight of his office and, like the Secretary of State for Wales, jump on the boat, get this investment over the waterline and deliver this levelling up bid in mid Wales? Prime Minister. I congratulate my honourable friend on uh, the the campaign he's running for what sounds like an absolutely beautiful plan to reopen the Montgomery uh, Canal. Uh, He won't have long to wait for the decision on that scheme, uh, but I can assure him uh, that Wales is receiving thumping quantities of uh, the UK's uh, levelling up fund already. uh, 5% of total uh, UK allocations in the first round uh, will be in Wales, and uh, I thank him for the lobbying that he's uh, he's, uh, put in today. Let's go to the leader of the SNP, Ian Blackford. Thank you very much. Of course, while they're talking about levelling up and the government benches, we in Scotland are looking at settling up for the people of Scotland. Mr Speaker, I hope the Prime Minister will be reflecting on the judgment from the Parliamentary and Health Ombudsman yesterday that judged that there was maladministration in dealing with the 1950s WASPy women. It's about time that the government delivered justice for those involved. Mr Speaker, last night we heard from the Prime Minister's former Chief of Staff. On the 15th of October, the Prime Minister didn't believe that the NHS would be overwhelmed and thought that the over-80s should be sacrificed to the whims of the deadly virus. The Prime Minister wrote those words whilst our NHS was facing the darkest moments in its history. While doctors and nurses were fighting to contain the pandemic, the Prime Minister was actively pushing for the virus to be allowed to run rampant through towns and cities. The Prime Minister was willing, in his own words, to allow the bodies to be piled high. Mr Speaker, on October 15, 2020, 60,000 people had already died. How can anyone have put faith and trust in a Prime Minister who actually typed the words, get COVID and live longer? Uh, Mr Speaker, I I think that the uh, Right Honourable Gentleman uh, grossly mischaracterizes uh, the substance of those discussions, what I said. Uh, I've, I've, I've made uh, points in the House of Commons already in the, in the chamber about uh, the language that I'm alleged to have, uh, to have used. Uh, but I think what everybody in this country understands is that the uh, decisions that we had to take uh, at that time uh, were incredibly difficult. And of course, um, this in no way uh, detracts from the the grief and the suffering of those who have lost loved ones to, to COVID, uh, who, uh, whose uh, families have been hit by the consequences of, of that disease. Uh, but as I said earlier to the, to the Labour leader, we have to balance very, very difficult uh, harms on, on either side. There are no good uh, ways through, Mr Speaker. The, a lockdown also causes immense suffering and a loss of life chances uh, and damage to health and to, and to mental health. And in due course, uh, the Right Honourable Gentleman knows very well that there will be a chance to uh, look all, at all of this in a, in a full uh, public inquiry. Uh, but I'm, I must tell the House that I am content that we followed the scientific guidance uh, and we did whatever we could to save life and to minimise suffering and, of course, to protect our wonderful NHS. Blackfoot. Is that it? Is that it, Prime Minister? Because, you know, the reality is that the Prime Minister wrote these words himself. The over-80s were expendable. 
A Prime Minister is charged with protecting society, not putting folk at risk of an early death. Such a glib attitude towards human life is indefensible. The Prime Minister is simply, simply not fit for office. The clear pattern throughout this pandemic is that it is one rule for them and another rule for the rest of us. The reality, Mr Speaker, that the only way to get to the full truth over this UK Government's disastrous handling of the pandemic is for this cabal to be made to answer under oath. So will the Prime Minister confirm that in the interests of public health and confidence that the COVID inquiry will begin immediately and commit to appearing at the inquiry himself under oath before any general election is called? Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I, I, I appreciate why uh, it's so important for this country to have a full public inquiry, and that's why uh, I made the announcement to the House that we would. And I also think that it's right that it should go ahead as soon as is reasonable. Uh, I don't think that right now, in the middle of a, uh, a, a third wave, uh, when, we're, uh, as, when we're seeing many of the, the key people involved in uh, fighting the pandemic, uh, who that were very, very heavily occupied. I don't think it's right to ask them uh, to devote a lot of their time uh, to uh, a public inquiry of the kind that I think we would all want to, to see. And that's why I think it's right that it should start in, uh, in the spring, uh, when I'm uh, pretty confident, and, uh, and so are so the uh, rest of the scientific community, that we will really be in a much, much better position and able uh, to go ahead. And, and that is the the time uh, to begin the public inquiry. But that doesn't mean, Mr Speaker, that we aren't continuing to learn lessons all the time. We now have David Davis online. David Davis. Mr Speaker, 40 years ago, this country led the world in social mobility. Since then, we have fallen so far behind, we're now only 21st in the world rankings. If we're to succeed at levelling up the UK, then we must restore social mobility for working class pupils right across the country. The fastest and most cost effective way to do that is to re-engineer the classroom, to capitalize on the benefits of modern technology, using artificial intelligence to provide lessons tailored to the ability of each and every child. Countries around the world are already doing this, from America to Australia, China to Estonia, and private schools in the UK, including Eton, are already doing it using world-class British technology. Will the Prime Minister undertake to use modern technologies to give every working class child the opportunity to reach their full potential, opportunity based on their abilities, not on where they grew up or how rich their parents were? Prime Minister. Yes, Mr Speaker, I'm thankful uh, to my right honourable friend for the personal tutorial he gave me in uh, we're, we're using a laptop uh, in, in the opportunities provided by this type of technology uh, and the, the massive increase in uh, the cognitive powers of, of kids that is, that is now made possible by uh, these types of, of technology. Uh, and we are looking at supporting schools across the whole of the UK uh, with this kind of uh, advance uh, as, we, as we continue to level up. Sir Geoffrey Donaldson. Uh, Mr Speaker, in light of the judicial ruling in the High Court that the Northern Ireland Protocol repeals Article 6 of the Act of Union, which allows for unimpeded trade within the United Kingdom and between the constituent parts of the UK. What does the Prime Minister intend to do to fully restore the Act of Union for Northern Ireland and remove the Irish Sea border? Prime Minister. I'm grateful to the Right Honourable Gentleman. And uh, this is my first opportunity publicly to congratulate him on becoming leader of the DUP. I look forward to working with him uh, and uh, with the whole of the uh, executive in Northern Ireland uh, for uh, the people in Northern Ireland. As we've made clear and uh, as uh, we'll be setting out uh, today, uh, we want to, to sort out the issues in the, in the protocol. We think there are practical steps you can take uh, to do that. And uh, in the, as far as the court case uh, is concerned, nothing in the protocol affects the uh, territorial uh, integrity of the United Kingdom or uh, or Northern Ireland's place within it. Let's see if we can pick up the pace with Theo Clark. Theo. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last Friday, I joined local health officials and members of the public at a consultation meeting on maternity services in Staffordshire. Maternity was temporarily suspended at Stafford's County Hospital at the height of the pandemic so that wards could be used to treat COVID-19 patients. But does my right honourable friend agree with me that anyone who wants to give birth at Stafford's County Hospital should be able to do so? Let's go to the Prime Minister. Prime Minister. My, my honourable friend raises a very, very important point, and a, a lot of uh, the hospitals that I've been around recently are, are uh, doing incredible work at getting back to pre-COVID levels of service, and I understand that NHS partners are working hard to uh, explore options for restoring maternity services at uh, a county hospital. Stephen Timms. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Together with the chairs of the committees dealing with Social Security in the Scottish Parliament, the Senate and the Northern Ireland Assembly, we've made a call that the £20 a week cut in universal credit due in October should not go ahead. A new Joseph Roundtree Foundation report shows that if it does go ahead, uh, out-of-work families with children will have a, an income way below what the general public regards as the minimum necessary for an acceptable standard of living. Instead of cutting down, will the Prime Minister not follow his own policy and level up and leave the £20 a week in place? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, what we want to do is level up across the whole of the UK by increasing uh, jobs, access to high-wage, uh, high-skilled uh, jobs and getting people off benefits and into work. And really, that is the, the big difference between his party and the party I lead. We want uh, to help people into, into work, and I'm afraid uh, that, as so often, uh, Labour wants to keep them uh, on welfare. I don't think that's the right way forward. Uh, we want to see higher wages, and that's why uh, we're increasing the, uh, we've increased the living wage by record amounts, uh, and that's why uh, we, are, we are working. Uh, to ensure that this is a jobs-led recovery. And all the signs are at the moment uh, that that is succeeding. But, it, of course, it depends on people getting those jabs and uh, when, they're, when they're asked to. Let's go to Alberta Costa. Alberta. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I welcome the cautious move to step four this week, which has only been made possible due to the fantastic vaccine rollout in South Leicestershire and across our country. And the fact that every adult has now been offered the vaccine, does my right honourable friend agree with me that if we don't move forward now, we risk opening up later in the autumn or winter when the NHS is under more pressure and children have returned to school, which seems to be the reckless approach of the party opposite? Uh, it's, it's spot on. He, he, he's completely right. Uh, the, the, the question for those who attack the, the current policies, if, if not now, when? I, I, we looked at the data this morning with, uh, with uh, uh, the, the chief medical officer, and he pointed out the extraordinary difference in the, uh, between the number of people uh, being hospitalised now in the older generations and the, the number of people who are being hospitalised uh, in previous waves amongst the older generations. Thanks to the vaccine rollout, we have radically changed the way the disease uh, affects our society. It's that change that's enabling us to make the progress that we are. And uh, as, as he says, if not now, when? Let's go to Rosie Cooper. Rosie. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The government claims that fires in schools are very rare and are mostly confined to one room or cause little or no damage. The fire at Asmore Primary School in my constituency last month severely damaged three rooms, spreading far beyond the original site. This has had a devastating effect on the school and the pupils now face 18 months of disruption to their education. Would the Prime Minister commit to a mandate that all new skill, new build schools and major refurbishments are installed with sprinklers so that schools don't suffer the same fate as Asmore Primary in Ormskirk? Prime Minister. I thank the Honourable Lady very much and um, I, I want to thank also the fire service for their uh, outstanding response to the to the fire at Asmore uh, Primary School. I'm sorry for the disruption that uh, children are experiencing. Um, we can't be complacent about fires in, in, fires at all, let alone fires in uh, in schools. And the Department for Education is consulting on guidance uh, to 
uh, improve fire safety in schools further. And I, I would encourage the Honourable Lady to, to make representations to, uh, in that consultation. Margaret Farley. Thank you, Mr Speaker. One of my constituents has recently attempted to sell a house only for the surveyor and a state agent to inform him that they require an external wall system certificate. However, under current Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors guidance, an EWS1 form should not be expected for properties and buildings under 18 metres high, which includes my constituents' property in Cambus Lang. Will the Prime Minister clarify if the UK Government intends to take any steps to ensure lenders and others adhere to RIC's guidance on EWS1 forms, and will he meet with me to discuss how I can assist my constituent? Prime Minister. The Honourable Lady makes an extremely important point, and that's why my uh, right honourable friend, the Housing Secretary, will be making a statement uh, to the House shortly, uh, because uh, we must be clear that the risk of uh, uh, from fire to, to life in homes is very, very low, and ho leaseholders uh, should not be trapped in their properties, unable to uh, buy or, or to sell, because uh, their uh, their properties have been unfairly uh, maligned uh, in in that in that way, and lenders and valuers should not be asking for uh, for EWS one forms on buildings below uh, 18 metres. Uh, my right honourable friend, the Housing Secretary, will be setting uh, out more in uh, a bit later on about how we propose to ensure that that doesn't happen. Flail. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Yeah. Dame Vera Lynn did so much for our nation. Now a fitting memorial is planned on the White Cliffs of Dover yeah. 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 to ensure this national icon continues to be celebrated for decades to come. Does my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, agree that Dame Vera was a great inspiration to women, showing the difference we can make and her contribution throughout the whole of her life to our national life? Will he extend his support to this important Dame Vera Lynn National Memorial Project? Yeah. Prime Minister, I think we could all unite. Yes, I think, I think, Mr. Speaker, this is a pretty safe uh, bet for, for everybody. I, I, we all uh, remember and love the songs of Dame Vera Lynn, and uh, she brought the whole country together at a, a pretty dark time and uh, is a great, great uh, inspiration for many, many people. And I, I thank uh, my honourable friend for the campaign that she's leading for a fitting memorial and very happy to support it. Abraham. Yeah. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, since um, July 2019, the Department for Work and Pen Pensions have undertaken 124 internal process reviews following the deaths, the deaths, Mr. Speaker, of 97 claimants and 27 where claimants suffered serious harm, a threefold increase since 2012. Not once was this mentioned in the Health and Green Disability uh, paper last night. Many believe that this is just the tip of the iceberg, and many also believe that the government can no longer keep marking their own homework. We need to understand the true scale and causes of these deaths in an independent public inquiry. So will the Prime Minister meet with me and with the delegation of bereaved rel re uh, relatives to discuss this. I, I thank the Honourable Lady very much, and I, I, I hope the House will forgive me if I say I didn't catch every word of, uh, of what she said, uh, but I, I believe that she was referring to the, the, the tragic uh, death of, uh, of, of, of those who are, uh, who are claiming benefits, and I, I'm, I'm certainly determined to make sure that she gets uh, a, a, a full account of, of what we're doing to put this right and, uh, and, and, can and uh, that she will meet with the relevant minister as soon as that can be arranged. Corrin. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, last week I met with one of Truro's um, daffodil farmers and there is real concern in the industry that they won't be able to have their uh, daffodil pickers in the fields this January. Now, I know the DWP is working with the Dutch College and is hoping to run a local sector-based work academy uh, but this is a complex issue. Uh, we're requiring a long-term uh, solution. And I wonder if my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, would meet with me and other Cornish MPs to see how we could resolve this long-term. Prime Minister. Uh, I'm only happy to meet my honourable friend at any time, uh, I, but I can assure her that uh, uh, we want to find uh, the, the, the workforce to, uh, to pick the flowers, uh, the beautiful Cornish uh, daffodils that uh, uh, you know, should not be born to blush unseen, as it were. Uh, if I if I if I remember the quote right, uh, they they should be 
uh, they should be uh, properly picked. And uh, uh, in addition to uh, developing the, the, the local, uh, to, to developing uh, the local uh, labour force and making sure that, that, that we, uh, we line up uh, younger people or uh, people across, the, uh, across Cornwall with the opportunities that there are, she must not forget uh, that uh, thanks to the EU settlement scheme, there are six million uh, EU nationals uh, still entitled uh, to live and work in this country who have taken advantage of that scheme. And never let it be said uh, that uh, we've done an injustice to, those, uh, to that group. <laughs> Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, local residents in Lancaster are opposing the conversion of a popular local pub, the Britannia, into a 10-bed student-let. Now, the Housing Secretary says that the current planning system doesn't give people influence over local developments, but his party's developers charter gags local residents and hands yep. power to a Whitehall-appointed uh, yeah. board uh, yeah. of developers, resulting in low-quality, unaffordable housing. So isn't this the case? of the Prime Minister paying back his party's developer paymasters by selling out local communities. Yeah. Yeah. Prime Minister. Uh, I, Mr Speaker, I don't think I've heard such total cobblers in all my life, except possibly from the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, that is absolutely, un that, is, that is not what the, uh, the bill does. Uh, on the contrary, uh, it gives uh, local people the power to protect. If I understood her correctly, she had, it was a pub, I think, called the Britannia, uh, that she wanted to uh, protect. Uh, it, 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 there are, there are uh, measures that we're bringing forward to allow local people to uh, to protect uh, such uh, uh, places of, of vital uh, local importance, uh, and, and 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 when it comes to development, actually uh, the the power will remain vested firmly uh, with local people to make sure uh, that they protect their green space, they protect uh, the green belt, and they only have uh, development in the places where they, the local people, want it. Exactly. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Yeah. I'm sure my right honourable friend is not surprised. People are keen to move to my North Devon constituency, but we, like much of the South West, are experiencing severe housing shortages. Local government needs urgent help and support now, but might he consider, as part of planning reforms, binding covenants being applied to a proportion of new builds to be used as a primary residence and not a holiday let or second home, and that existing homes must register for a change of use if becoming a holiday let? to ensure vibrant coastal communities do not become winter ghost towns. Yeah, yeah. Prime Minister. Uh, uh, my honourable friend is a, is, a, is a massively effective advocate for the people of North Devon, and uh, I, uh, she's made these points to me before, and I know that, uh, I know that uh, she, she's right. Uh, we, we've we've uh, put higher rates of stamp duties, she knows, on the, on the buying of uh, additional properties such as, uh, such as second homes. But what we've also got to do is make sure that uh, young people growing up around our country, uh, rather contrary to the, uh, the uh, instincts of the, the previous Labour speaker, uh, have the chance to, 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 uh, of home ownership in uh, the place where they, where they live. And that's what our uh, first home scheme uh, will help to do with a, a new discount of at least 30% prioritised for first-time buyers. Richard Burke. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister is having to self-isolate just as hundreds of thousands of people across the country are having to do because of his reckless Covid strategy. But unlike the Prime Minister, unlike the Prime Minister, not everybody has been able to run off to a luxury country mansion with a heated swimming pool. And also, unlike the Prime Minister, so many people across our country are having to survive on just £96 sick pay per week. So could the Prime Minister survive on £96 sick pay per week? And if he couldn't, why does he think if it's not good enough for him, it's good enough for everyone else? Yeah. Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, he's quite wrong uh, because the... Uh, everybody who's uh, self-isolating is entitled, in addition to, uh, to the equivalent of the living wage and statutory sick pay, uh, they're entitled uh, to not, uh, also to help in extreme circumstances from their, uh, from their, from their local councils uh, and also to a £500 payment uh, to help them uh, with, with, with self-isolation. And it remains absolutely vital uh, that everybody does it. Let's go to Bill Wigan. Bill? Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Given the global pandemic, public criticism of my right honourable friend's extraordinary leadership should be dismissed. He put the lives of my constituents first and has had to adapt to the lessons that COVID-19 has taught us. Sadly, the same cannot be said for the handling of tuberculosis by DEFRA, 
Will my right honourable friend meet me to discuss the current TB strategy and how we can improve it? Prime Minister. I'm always delighted to meet my right honourable friend. And uh, I can tell him that, uh, and I, you know, I, I learned, I listened to him and I learned from him about, uh, about bovine TB and, uh, and badgers. Uh, we do think that the badger cull has led to a reduction uh, in the disease, but nobody wants to continue. And I'm sure that my uh, honourable friend doesn't want to continue with, con with the, the cull of a protected species, uh, beautiful uh, mammals, uh, in, in, indefinitely. And so I do think it's a good thing that we're acceler accelerating other elements of our, our strategy, particularly vaccination. Uh, I, I, I must tell him I do think that is the right way forward. And I do think we should begin, uh, if we can, to phase out badger culling in this country. Sarah Olney. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, one million children, including my own daughter, were out of school last week due to the need to self-isolate when there's a positive test confirmed in their bubble. Can I firstly just pay tribute to all the teachers, both in my constituency and across the country, yeah, yeah. who have done incredible work in keeping learning going under such difficult yeah. circumstances? And I was really pleased to be able to thank my daughter's school teacher in person yesterday. Can the PM confirm that the government's approach to managing this pandemic will guarantee that all children will have an uninterrupted academic year when they return to school after the summer break. Prime Minister. She's absolutely right to focus on the, the needs of children in this pandemic and uh, the, the paramount importance of, uh, of keeping them in school. And we will do everything we can to ensure that uh, uh, we, we are able to get schools back in, uh, in September. I have every confidence that we uh, we will be able to, but that will be greatly assisted, as I've never tired of repeating, uh, Mr Speaker, this afternoon, that will be assisted if everybody uh, goes and gets their second jab, or first uh, jab. Mr Speaker, as Chair of the All Party Parliamentary Group on Missing People, every year 180,000 people are reported to the police as missing from across our constituencies in the United Kingdom. And I'm sure the Prime Minister and everyone in this House will find that completely unacceptable. The Home Office's strategy on missing people has not been reviewed since 2011. Will the Prime Minister please urgently get this strategy reviewed and updated? And with that, will the Prime Minister meet the Missing People's Charity, Children's Society and myself to look at this very important issue affecting our society? Prime Minister. I thank my honourable friend and I, I would just remind him that 95% of missing persons incidents are are actually resolved uh, without anybody uh, coming to harm or without the, the missing individual coming uh, to harm. But uh, I thank him for the work that he does on this issue because uh, it matters a great deal uh, clearly to, to, to the, the remaining 5%, which is uh, an unacceptably high uh, uh, level of, uh, of, uh, of suffering. And uh, I'm, I'm certainly uh, determined that we should uh, continue to work with uh, all the relevant agencies, the police, uh, social services, uh, to improve our, our, our response, and uh, we'll be very happy to, uh, to take up his offer and ensure that he gets the meeting uh, that he needs. Final question, Dr Lisa Cameron. Please. Many thanks, Mr Speaker. As Chair of the Disability All-Party Group, I hosted a Disability Confident Workshop for Members of Parliament, and I'm delighted that we are now approaching 25% of cross-party MPs being accredited as Disability Confident Employers. So would the Prime Minister become a Disability Confident Employer himself, encourage colleagues to do so, and put his support behind improved representation and inclusion in Parliament for people with disabilities? Yeah. Yeah. Prime Minister. I, I thank the Honourable Lady very much for her suggestion uh, that the government should become a disability confident employer. I, I will, I'm, I'm sure that we already are, but I will, uh, I will investigate the matter and uh, make sure uh, that she gets uh, an answer by letter. Thank you very much. I will now stand down your standing Prime Minister as well. And just to say to everybody, Please, when we get back, we've got to get through more questions. We've got to get back on time. So let's work for each other. So now we're suspending the House three minutes to enable necessary arrangements to be made for the next business order.